The Iowa International Center Dialogue Series is a monthly educational program available at no cost to the public, thanks to the generous support of DuPont Pioneer and supporting sponsors. Dialogue events and videos offer a unique opportunity for our community to engage in and learn from important cultural conversations with international experts, and to draw on and highlight the extensive knowledge these individuals bring to our schools, workplaces, and community. For more information about the Dialogue Series and the Iowa International Center, please visit www.iowainternationalcenter.org. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand up. I'll, I'll be moving around. I'm a stand-up, sit-down kind of person, especially when we've got a nice intimate group here. But I wanted to thank you all for joining us today for this very important discussion about tapping into the untapped workforce, um, and that being our immigrant and refugee populations. I'm thrilled, actually, to have this outstanding panel with us. They represent a group of employers at various stages within their integration and inclusion of refugee populations. So we've got some that have very tenured programs and some that have just launched programs within the last year. So it'll be, it'll be exciting to hear from them and to learn a little bit more about how they've integrated the refugee and the immigrant population within their workplaces. Um, just to share with you, I am a firm believer that we learn best by learning from each other. So we, we really enjoy um, and welcome questions of our panel. And uh, so feel free if you've got questions along the way to raise your hand. They have all agreed to take the questions as they come because if it's top of mind for you right now, it might be top of mind for somebody else. So don't be afraid to ask some of those questions. Um, so but for many of you, you might be wondering, why is this topic important to manpower? Um, you know, we're a staffing firm, and so why, why would we care about working with refugees and the immigrant population? Well, this is an important topic to us because manpower, we are a global company. We're in 82 different countries around the world. And our job, the work that we perform, is connecting great people with great companies. We help those job seekers find opportunities with the we help job seekers find opportunities. Is that on? Okay. Uh, we help them find opportunities with employers throughout the globe. And in today's marketplace right now, you know, we're experiencing some um, serious unemployment rates here in the state of Iowa, and that is not that is not dissimilar to what other countries are feeling as well too. The talent shortage is at, is a global crisis at this point. So employers, in order to be successful in finding the talent they need to fill their, their production floors or to fill their call centers or to find the engineers, they need to be taking a look at their workforce and their human capital strategies differently than they ever have in the past. So that means tapping into some non-traditional workforces that they may have not considered previously. And that's where our immigrant and refugee population comes into place. And the panel that we have here, I'm excited because these, these are the trailblazers. These are the organizations that have decided that they need to step outside the box to find the talent they need in order to meet their client demands. And so without further ado, I won't talk on and on about manpower, which I could all day, but <laughs> without further ado, I want to get to the introduction of our, our great panel, panelists here. The first panelist we have is Brenda Camuto, and Brenda is the Chief Operating Officer at Capital City Fruit in Norwalk, Iowa. Brenda has, has been active as a business and community leader in Central Iowa for many years through service on the board of DMARC, Des Moines Public Housing Board, and other key organizations. He's passionate about educating the community on the value of diverse workforce, as well as providing a welcoming environment for new Iowans. Brendan, sorry, multitask or multi-handed here. Um, sorry about that. And Brendan and Capital City Fruit have been actively employing immigrant and refugee populations since the late 80s. So he is our, our more, most tenured panelist and, and has had a long-standing robust program. So Brendan, Brendan will be our resident expert here. 
Sitting next to Brendan is Lei Wee, and I'm very excited to have Lei Wee on the panel. He actually is filling in for John Anderson from Pine Ridge Farms, and um, and actually, Lei Wee's story is very unique because Lei Wee is a refugee himself, and so he knows what it's like to be a job seeker coming to a new country and understanding the challenges and what it takes to find employment. And now, actually, Lei, pro or Lei Wee proudly is a human resources associate at Pine Ridge, and so he will be able to share with us some unique perspective. Lei's been with um, in the U.S. since 2007 and has worked as an interpreter, so he's got some great information he'll be able to share with us. Next, we have Melissa Reinch. Melissa is the Human Resources and Payroll Manager for Limar Industries in Des Moines. Uh, Melissa graduated from Simpson College with a bachelor's degree in business management and minors in sociology and human resources management. What's interesting about Melissa's experience is that while Limar is just launching within the last couple of years their um, inclusion program, her previous employer was very involved with hiring the immigrant and the refugee uh, population. Population. So she's got experience from working with a long-standing program to an organization now that's just relaunching a program as well. So you'll be able to speak about working with multiple ethnicities and some of the challenges from safety perspectives and inclusion. And so we're excited because Melissa's got a great human resources perspective with over 13 years experience. And then lastly on the end we have Brenda Fugere. And Brenda started with 3M. She actually is working as human resources manager for 3M in Ames. And she's been working with 3M since 2006. Moved around um, actually in Minnesota and Wisconsin. It's kind of funny, Brenda and I were talking and, and she and I missed each other in Menominee, Wisconsin by about a year. And we had, when Manpower was working with 3M in, in Menominee. So, but um, Brenda actually, What's interesting about Brenda's experience is they recently piloted a program at 3M in Ames working with the refugee population in partnership with Manpower. We had talked about some recruiting challenges we were having and so Brenda's got the unique perspective as an organization that's just launching their inclusion program and some of the challenges that they've experienced. So. Great panel we have here. We're very, very excited. So without any further ado here, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about actually some of the realities of, of the refugee population in, in the immigrant population in the in the state of Iowa. We have over 500 um, immigrants and refugees, or I'm sorry, 500, over 500 refugees that come to Iowa each year and many more that are relocating from other states. So we've got a great influx of, of available talent pool that we can tap into. Some of the challenges, again, that these individuals experience are the ability to find work and the language barriers. And so that's kind of what we'll be talking about today, but this is a great resource. Um, also, too, this group you will find they have such a strong work ethic. They want to find work and want to find opportunities. So, again, these employers have figured out how to tap into this group and, and um, really help them get a, a get a step up. So, Brendan, without any further ado, the you know taking uh, expanding a workforce and human capital strategy to include the immigrant and refugee population can be very daunting for many organizations. You've had a long-standing program how did why did capital city fruit decide that they wanted to tap into this untapped labor market uh, well it was about 30 years ago so uh, I actually was working in the warehouse but I, I wasn't privy to the actual de decisions back then but uh, I do know that the economy was not too dissimilar to what we what we're seeing now with very low unemployment and there was a desire to find dedicated reliable employees and the first person we hired was from the country of Mexico he was an immigrant through the amnesty in 1986 and you know he came in did a great job and then he knew some friends and we hired them and then he had, knew some family members and hired them. Next thing you know, we, we are, the population members we had grew pretty pretty dramatically. To, to now, it's 38 percent of our workforce. Um, and well, I think from one to probably three continents besides North America, um, 
probably about 10 different languages spoken. So it, it's, uh, it's really part of our culture now. And, and again, why we, do, why we do it today, because we're looking for a dedicated, reliable workforce in, in a time when the economy is really um, very tough for employers in terms of finding talent, because the unemployment rate is, I think, 4% or something like that. But in reality, it's probably about 2% when you really factor in people that maybe are unable to work or not, not capable of working. So uh, that, that makes it very difficult to find the talent you need to grow. And the population isn't growing at a rate that a lot of companies are growing. I think the CEO of Principal Financial was talking about that a few weeks ago. That, you know, my company's growing at this percentage, but the population in Iowa is only growing this percentage. So uh, immigrants and refugees are coming from other countries, so obviously that's, that's helping with the growth. And so I think long term, Iowa really, really needs to tap into this. Excellent, excellent. And Brenda, I'd like to ask the same question of you, is why did 3M decide to uh, pilot the program working with the refugees? Hi everyone, so 3M has an area, I don't know if you're familiar with 3M Ames, we make sandpaper. You have no idea how much sandpaper goes out of that <laughs> facility. So part of the area that we have is kind of manual and they have the discs, it's a round sandpaper disc and they have to put a little button on because it goes on a power tool. So manpower was our one of our key um, people to supply the workers for that. And we were really struggling to, number one, find people, and number two, to keep them, to keep them long enough after we trained. It didn't take a lot of training, but we couldn't keep them. So, I mean, to just give you numbers, just to have an idea, we were, I think Sonia shared with me, we were 500,000 discs behind. <laughs> and when you're talking manufacturing, and we just kept getting more and more behind because we couldn't find the workers. So. Um, I don't know if you want me to get into the challenge of convincing sure. my Absolutely. management team. So we are manufacturing. So you've got 8,500 pound fork, tr fork trucks driving around. You've, it, it's manufacturing. So it, safety and the communication was the, the big fear of my management team. And how, if something happened to one of them where they maybe got hurt, how, how can we handle that? So that, I think, was the biggest fear that we had. Being a manufacturing facility, how do we work around the communication and concern of the safety barrier? And it took me probably a year to convince them that I think we can do this with the help of interpreters on each shift. And, you know, I, I don't know if I want to get into that, but we've, we've found a way to do it. So, yeah. Excellent. And you know, we'll just pass on down the line to Melissa. So, Melissa, you've got some experience with a, a company that had some long-term, you know, had worked with the, the refugee population for quite a long time, and then your new organization. Can you speak a little bit about the company that you're working with now? Why did they decide to get in? And what were some of the concerns that your new company had as well? Well, when I started at Lemar, they weren't actually uh, bringing on any refugees. And from my previous experience at Kateko, I was able to convince them that um, it was better for bringing in the employees. We, we couldn't find the welders that we needed. We can't find, and then we have these people coming in from all over the place that have the same skill sets, just they can't communicate it in the same language or they would need interpreters and one of their biggest fears, they are agricultural. And so you have that old school mindset of, you know, this is just how we do it and, and that's the only way and, and trying to change that was just a matter of saying, hey, keep it simple, stupid, you know, <laughs> I mean, and, and that's the truth. You, you can take pictures, you can have uh, interpreters come in and, and help them through the safety process, the orientation process and all that stuff. Just keep it simple. You know, that was the big thing, big push for us. Follow-up question mm -hmm. that is, how long did it take to create a culture of change management? How long did it take to convince, and, and Brenda, maybe you can add to that too, from the, the, I think you alluded to that a little bit with 3M, but how long does it, does it take for an organization from senior management on down to understand that, you know what, this is a viable option for us? Um, let's see, I, I think I forced it on them. Um, they didn't have a choice. <laughs> In this particular company, I was fortunate enough to be senior management, and I was able to say, we're gonna do it, period. You know, I don't, I'm not gonna discriminate, I'm not gonna do any of these things, and I just used all those big <laughs> words on them, and they felt like, 
they had no choice at our at our other company. It takes quite some time. I mean, you know, at Cateco, it took quite some time to get everybody on board, you know, because it was a matter of uh, implementing all the new directional processes and the pictures and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> So with that, so what were some of the things that you did? Did you have inclusion training for your entire staff or was it just senior management driving the process? You know, it was senior management and then we went on down to the supervisors and then the leads and we did them in small groups so that they would understand and walked them through easy ways to get them to give the instructions to the new employees that didn't have the same skill sets or language skill sets. Uh, available to them. A lot of it was pairing, um, you know, somebody who was mid-level English speaking with somebody who couldn't for a little while until they could get used to the actual process. Uh, but it was little by little, small groups at a time, and, you know, we were bringing them in only as small groups at a time uh, so they wouldn't be overwhelmed and so that we could create that change of culture. That's the biggest thing. Giving these people the confidence when they come in uh, that, that, hey, you know, you, you know how to do this. You don't have to feel um, like a, a outcast or anything like that. So bringing them in in small groups at a time, you know, one or two people at a time so they could work closely with people, establish those relationships that people uh, would normally establish in a, in a workforce that doesn't have the inclusion. So by doing that, you get the experienced then, you get the experienced immigrant and refugee population in your workforce and then um, they can work with newer people as they come in and, and help them feel included and know what they're talking about. Um, the next, and actually, I don't even like it, do I? I'm loud enough. <laughs> I would need you just. You wouldn't need me, okay. All right. So we talked, we just touched the surface on, on the immigrant inclusion and, and some of the concerns that organizations have. It's sometimes, you know, the success of any um, inclusion program is driven from top down, but it's oftentimes those individuals who are working directly with those that are unlike them where the problems occur. So can we as a panel talk about how do you address um, the inclusion at the quote unquote line level? Brenda, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, it, it actually is not an issue anymore with us um, because it's just so so it's a part of our culture now. But I can remember there was a period maybe 20 years ago where uh, that that was a struggle. It, but you know what? When when people work side by side, they're not strangers after a while, and they get to know each other, and they get to know about their families, and they're humanized, and they're not just this immigrant group or whatever. And let's let's be honest. I mean, there is a segment of our society that is very anti-immigrate immigration. And, uh, and, and, and which is strange to me because we're all we're all originally immigrants, unless you're Native American. But uh, but really, I mean, there there is a kind of an undercurrent that that exists out there. And, and some of my employees who were born in America have come up to me, you know, months later and said, "Oh, you know, I've totally changed since working here. I've completely changed my attitude." So a lot of it, you, you, I don't think you have to force a lot of this stuff. Um, people try and make a lot of stuff a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. I mean, you put people next to each other and they see each other doing a good job, they're going to naturally start talking to each other and they, they can figure out ways to communicate even if there is a language barrier. And they learn about their families, they see, maybe they see the, the kids come pick them up or something like that. So it really humanizes who they are and I think that's the best thing you can do right there because uh, when people see that they're just like you and me, then, then that fear goes away and what they've heard in the, in the media or, or from, uh, you know, kind of various groups is not, is not true. So, um, but there's all, there's other things you can do if you want to do more, more formalized approaches, and maybe some errors can get into that. But um, you, you want to—I think it's important to train people about, this, particularly if you're bringing someone from a new culture. What's some of the, uh, what, what's significant about those cultures? So, the, for example, there's some uh, some groups where if you take their photo. That's almost like stealing their soul. They don't like that, so you want to. So that's good to know because you don't want to go and just take their photo without asking for permission ahead of time. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with food, and you have to be. You know, we have some Muslims that work for us. You got to be very careful about what you're serving. You always want to have an option for for them because they don't eat uh, pork. I believe is what they don't eat. So. Um, you know, those are some. You, you want to make sure you educate yourself about um, what the what the various cultural uh, and what their cultural uh, identities are and things like that, and make sure other people know that too, because it could lead to some embarrassing situations or make people feel uncomfortable. Lady, if you'd like to share with us 
how did you, what, what have you done? Oops. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm not following the rules from the, the <laughs> from the, the uh, start of the um, discussion here. So, Lee, if you could tell us a little bit about what your organization has done to help non immigrants and non refugees understand inclusion and, and be more inclusive of, of the rest of your workforce? Well, um, my company, before uh, they bring in refugee, um, immigrants, you know, they have a meeting, the management have a meeting, you know, they talk about what we're going to do, as uh, Brian said earlier, um, because a lot of them, they don't speak English, they don't know, you know, what they're going to get into, so a, a lot of employees, they already work there, like, especially American people, not American, sorry, um, people that's been in the country a long, long time, you know, um, they, they kind of, they add different. So um, they, they have uh, concerns, you know, about you know how they're gonna work together. Um, but uh, you know, after they had a meeting, and then uh, they decided to hire um, more uh, immigrants and refugee people. Um, and then uh, first, when they start off, it's kind of tough. But uh, after that, you know, um, everybody get along, you know, and then a lot of. People that already worked there, you know, a long time, and they get used to the people that, I mean, just uh, came in. So they kind of, you know, became a close friend, like a, a family. So they help each other. So uh, every, everything's going well. Yeah. Thank you. And then, yes. Are we still talking about the inclusion? <laughs> yes. <laughs> your permit, your, your, your non staff? How, how did you get them to understand and buy into working with individuals that are different than them? Here at my new location, that was probably a little bit easier because I just posed the question backwards. I actually said, you know, well, I, I stated to them, you don't have, I've never had a single refugee or immigrant come to me and say that I can't do this job because I can't understand what they're saying or I'm not going to understand this process or anything like that. Whereas the other side, the flip side is, is well, how are we going to do this because we have all these safety videos in English and et cetera, et cetera. And it's just posing them the question backwards. Well, why can they come in here and say there is no hurdle and yet we're saying there's these hurdles? And I know safety is a number one concern, but um, just teaching them to tolerance is huge. Uh, it, <laughs> One of the things um, with, uh, I have a large Asian population um, and they're very, keep your head down, I wanna just work and uh, very much more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not individualistic, in, is that the right word? <laughs> Where, you know, we are taught to work by ourselves, we gotta get our work done by ourselves and they come in and um, they prefer to work as groups and they're sociable and um, not, uh, I'm not gonna leave here until this job is done and I think uh, educating people that, you know, these are the different types of traits and characteristics that these each of these little individual cultures have that can benefit us, not only as a workplace, but you as a line worker, you know, the, he's not going to let you stay two hours late without staying and helping you, you know. And they all get very receptive about it, you know. Speaking from my old company, that's, it, it's hard to talk on because I think it, they started years and years and years ago, years prior to me and bringing in a bunch of different people. Um, and the only issue we would have there is the occasional new person, non-immigrant, coming in and saying, I can't work with that person. I can't understand a lick of what they're saying and they're, they're my leader, you know? And it's just like, well, everybody else can, so see you later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so just, um, you have to teach tolerance and they have to understand, and I know he said, he spoke not forcing it, because it does e eventually become natural. And I do have a quick story to share, just because recently, this last week, I was just mind blown. I have um, several Bosnians and several Burmese at my current location right now. And two, one Bosnian and one Burmese guy kind of paired up together in their work area, and they're welder fabricators. Very, both of them very skilled with where they came from. Now my Burmese gentleman speaks not a lick of English, cannot understand me without an interpreter whatsoever. And the Bosnian uh, needs an interpreter quite a bit, but yet 
they communicate with each other daily. They actually come, go to each other's houses now. Like they have become very good friends. And I'm like, how on earth does that work? <laughs> Like, but it, they said something about the act, because I did ask, I was like, how does this work between you two? He doesn't even understand me. And, and he made a comment that just, it's the accents, they can work well with each other. So mixing those groups, it just works. I mean, I, <laughs> I maybe have a nice story to share too, but I'll, I'll give you, um, I think the question was, how did we work with that? Uh, the the best thing that we had was an interpreter on every shift. So currently we have four refugees on each shift. We run, run three shifts. So there's an interpreter on each one. So that has worked well, and the interpreter helps with safety training and all of that. But uh, again, to give you some statistics, and I'll explain this then. So we started with 21 people in this area, and currently we're down to 15 and 11 of those are refugees. Now that might not sound like a big number to you, but the reason for that is because the refugee workers have been so amazingly productive that, you know, before I, re I remember my supervisor just, <laughs> it's so painful because we knew that the work, current workers there were not working to their productivity. So they're doing 60 to 70% of target where the refugees came in and within, no kidding, probably three days, they're up to 80% of target. And then by a week, they're doing 100% of target. So we've been able to let people go and have less headcount in the area because these, they're amazing. They've been amazing. And what's also rubbed off on people, they are so friendly and they're so happy to be there that I think it wears off on the other people around that here they're producing 110% of target and wow, I, I gotta step up because <laughs> they weren't doing as well. I think I saw a question in the back. Yeah, I wanted to, if you could go further on that point. We're looking at uh, a worker which is a uh, refugee which is not, there are different types of uh, the immigration populations coming in and you have the refugee which in some ways is a more uh, 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 even transient than traditional family-based immigration. Mm -hmm. And so they're coming in with, I think, different expectations. Putting it broadly, that makes for different uh, job uh, performance differences based upon your expectation of, of your status both uh, as a refugee and immigration. Within the American tri uh, traditional workforce, the American uh, person will have a different set of expectations where they don't feel to prove everything to succeed on every opportunity on any time. And there's, this creates, I think, some conflict as to the merits of who's meritorious. I was wondering if you, that's kind of a broad question, if you could comment upon that, because I think it is an issue. Anyone want to comment on this? So, can you repeat that question? Yeah, no, th that is an excellent question. So I think if, if I'm understanding what you're asking is we've got the refugee population comes in, and this is, again, one of the advantages of working with this group is their work ethic is outstanding. They want to come in and perform and produce, and they, they, they're seeking perfection versus um, the non-refugee population, and, and you're right, that, that there is a sense of entitlement with, with the American workers who believe that, okay, well, I'm doing part of my job, so I should be rewarded and keep moving me up the ranks, whereas you've got, if they're working side by side next to a refugee who really is striving for that perfection and and, and wants to please. So is that, is that? Yeah, that's kind of an issue. I think there's an over, uh, under superiority and inferiority complex I've seen in the academic literature. You have to come here in order to prove something based upon something in the past where you feel you're not as, you know, America is the gold standard of, uh, of, of a lot of things. So, so basically, in, in refugees selling themselves short, based based on your skills, is that is that what you're saying? Well, they feel like they need to prove themselves right. on the American gold standard, and the average American doesn't necessarily feel the same way about everyday life. Okay. I just like to talk into the microphone. No. <laughs> 
actually, um, I've read several studies on that, and that's not necessarily the case. When it comes to refugees and immigrants coming into the United States, we got to keep in mind that their whole world has been uprooted, uplifted. They have no home. They have no money to raise their family or to, you know, continue living uh, a standard of living than what they were used to wherever they came from, which in, in most of the cases are more impoverished locations than, than what we are. Um, so when they come here, it's not necessarily, I feel I have to work up to this goal. It's they have to get a job in order to survive just like you and me. Uh, the difference is, is, as Karen was saying, is, is that Americans, we have this sense of entitlement. Um, we're just used to performing at 60, 70 percent of what our job descriptions actually say, because none of us fulfill 100 percent of our job description. I don't care how good, wealthy, skilled you are. None of us do. Uh, and sadly, um, when we bring in refugees and immigrants, they tend to outperform because they know they need this job, and they know that this is what their job descriptions are. And when they're told that this is what their job descriptions are, they're going to do it. Uh, how often would you hear a non-immigrant uh, say, I'm not sweeping the floor. That's not my job. My job is a welder. You know, I mean, you would never hear that from one of my immigrant or refugee employees. And that's mainly because they know that their options are a lot more limited here in the United States than what several of our options are. And they know they have no choice but to continue to do this so they can keep their job, so they can keep a paycheck and support themselves and their families. Um. Like Brendan referenced when he first started talking about capital fruits getting into the market, you know, you hire your first refugee or immigrant, and then he knows a couple friends, and he knows, and then you have a lot of employees from one population. Um, when you guys decide to hire someone else from a new population, is that kind of a strategic business decision, and how do you support that new culture that's coming into you? What steps do you take to support the new culture that's coming in? It's actually not a strategic business decision. Uh, they apply. We feel they're the better candidate for the job we hire. And, um, but as a result of that, then, then again, it starts over that, well, I have a friend, and can you hire this person, and I, I can vouch for him. And so that's kind of how it, it springs from us. It's not really a strategic decision. But you have to think about, okay, we're bringing in someone from a different country now that we're not familiar with. What do we need to do? And so you have to do a little bit of thinking around that. But our people are used to it now. So I can see if you're starting out, that's got to be really, uh, really uh, a huge challenge and maybe overwhelming. Um, I, I, one thing I always recommend, if you can hire two people from the same country, it makes it so much easier for them because they at least have someone to sit with at lunch and they, they, they can communicate with somebody and they, um, they feel like at least somebody can relate to them and eventually they'll branch out and all that stuff. But uh, it, I think for those first few weeks on the job, that really helps if they feel like there's somebody that knows what they went through, knows what, what the country they've come from. And so we try and do that. We try not to just hire one person, although you know sometimes we do, but if we can, we try and hire at least a couple from the same country so they have um, some familiarity. Although we did hire a Muslim from the Sudan and a Christian from the Sudan, so they, which are their bitter enemies in the Sudan, but they, they assure me, no, we're in America now, we're not, we're not enemies. And then, how many different languages are spoken at your... Oh, boy, I don't even know. I, I, would, I know for sure it's over 10. And it's actually, I remember now, we have four continents. I forgot it. we have a Kosovar Albanian, so he's, that's, that's a European, uh, from the European continent. So we have four con continents where employees come from outside North America, so. Where are your cadre of interpreters coming from? Are the same applicants that are applying for these other jobs, or are you contracting that out? How's that work? Well, we can probably give a plug since I'm on the board now for the Iowa Internet. <laughs> Because uh, they do have interpretive services, and we, we've used them for several years now, and they're very good. Uh, what, about 20 years ago, before I knew about IEC's interpretive services, uh, we just, uh, I can't remember how, we, we, found, we found somebody, and, and at that time, our, our, the primary lang second language was Spanish, so she worked with us for about 10 years, and, uh, and then moved, she moved, retired to Mexico, but, uh, you know, just, you, 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 you can look in the phone book, you can, the best thing, I think, is to find references, because anybody can say they're an interpreter, uh, but you want to make sure that they're certified and that they, um, that the employees do respond to them, and the best thing is just call another employer and say, hey, who do you, who do you all use? And, and that's a but good. But they are your employees. 
Not all kids, no, not all. no. Okay. Sometimes, it depends on the complexity of it. If we're talking safety issues, we like for example, annual OSHA safety training, we try and bring in um, you know, official certified interpreters. If it's some simple instruction or maybe a customer spec change, we use people that are bilingual. But it just kind of depends on the complexity of it. I, when it comes to safety and some of the more complex training, I think you want to get somebody from the outside and somebody who is uh, certified and because um, I've heard some, I know enough Spanish to know when someone's not doing something right, and I've heard a couple times my employees were not not getting the message across that I wanted to. So uh, I learned then that that might be an issue you want to bring an interpreter for us. Lee, we, if you can comment about how many languages are spoken at Pine Ridge, and um, and then your use of interpreters as a former interpreter, as an interpreter yourself. <laughs> um. In Pirate Farms, we have uh, a lot of different uh, languages that uh, employees speak. Um, what the company does, back in 2009, uh, the company started bringing uh, uh, different uh, speaking people uh, coming to the company. <clears throat> so after that, uh, the, the company seems these people are very good, you know, they work hard every day, you know. Um, they are here for, you know, for their family. Um, and then the other thing is um, a lot of them, uh, you know, when they don't speak English, the reason they're here in the United States, they just uh, want their kids and next generation uh, know how to speak language and then for a better life, basically. Um, and after that, when the uh, group expands and getting bigger, so the company start thinking about to bring somebody uh, to, uh, we call the administration side, like somebody that work in the office that speak that language, that's where that person, you know, can help them just better. Because it's not fair. Um, when you have employees that don't speak your language, you talk to them, but they don't really get it. Uh, you know, it is not really fair for them, you know, because they don't get enough information what they need. So that, that's what the company that I work for are doing. So we bring more staff in that speak the language, and then um, we help them with the um, uh, insurance benefit, benefits and then um, uh, vacation and a lot of things like uh, interpreting and safety or rotation. It's not only that and then we also do the um, interviewing because we speak the same language. Um, this is a lot of things that you know the, the, our company does. Not only that, some of them you know they have an issue with the uh, uh, they receive a letters, bills, or whatever from a, a company or from everywhere, and they can't read it, so they cannot take it to other people either. So what they do is they just bring you know when they come to work, and then they just give it to us. Okay, here you go. Can you help me read it? Okay, and after work they come back. We explain that this is what you need to do. The thing that we can do for them, so we're just going to do it. So it. It's very, very good. You know, the company do very good, and they also they're very happy. You know, so right now, you know, for me, it seems like both both sides pretty happy because we have uh, one, two, three, four. We have uh, five. Actually, we have five people that speak uh, different languages. Um, me myself, I speak five different languages. So even though people are from Burma, but they all different. Uh, they all speak the different languages because it's just like a United States. Each group they have their own states. Um, so basically about it. Thank you. You're welcome. So we talked a little bit about interpreters and the use of interpreters. How many of you have translated your employee paperwork into multiple languages, or is that something that, that you are doing or aren't doing? We've translated the uh, handbook into uh, Spanish, Vietnamese, and of course English. Um, so that's not every single language, obviously, but the, that was the bulk of the population. So that's, that's what we did. Um, we've we offer. There's a lot of resources for Spanish-speaking people, but there's not many for the other languages. So. Um, in America, it's very easy to find videos and tra safety training and things like that in Spanish. To find them in other languages is more of a challenge. So that's again where we'll bring in outside interpreters for stuff. Um, I, I think we got a little carried away with interpreting everything back, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago. <clears throat> and we kind of so then we started an English as a second language program on site. We started thinking, you know, maybe we're cradling them a little bit too much. And because um, I want the people that are here to assimilate to American culture, and I want to make sure that they're um, that they're trying to learn English because that'll help in the other areas of their life. 
And so, um, so we kind of there's kind of a little balance there. We we kind of backed off a little bit on on interpreting everything um, to try and get them to encourage them to learn uh, English. Um, and again, I think the re main reason is because a we want them to assimilate to our culture, and b we want them to be successful in other areas of life when they go to their parent teacher conferences. They can understand what the teachers say when they go to the grocery store. Um, so th that's sometimes you have to give people a little bit of push out of their comfort zone. So that we'll do that. So we kind of changed our thinking a little bit in the last 15 years. I don't know if that's the popular notion, but that's kind of what we did. And I, I, I definitely have noticed that our employees are learning English at a faster pace than they were 15 or 20 years ago. And again, I think that's important too for, for, from the standpoint of um, making sure I was more welcoming to immigrants and refugees because there's this kind of undercurrent that they're using up a bunch of services and they're takers and things like that. Um, and you know, th there is no doubt the first generation does require more resources. But I look at that more as an investment as opposed to someone taking because there's going to be a second generation and a third generation. And pre well, my kids, two of my older kids went to Roosevelt and those, a lot of those kids are second generation. They're going to college. So you got to look at more as an, as an investment as opposed to that, oh, they're coming and taking resources. You're investing in this generation so next, the future generations can be more successful. Oh. Lady, um, yeah, oh, we have a question back here. Okay. I'm just wondering um, for the panel as a whole, how many of you have programs for English language learners on site or cooperative programs with other organizations? Uh, what we do right now, we have a ESL class uh, in the company. So we have two different classes. Uh, basically, we have uh, four days a week. So um, we have the ESL teacher. They uh, come from uh, DMAC. So two classes. We one we start at 2:30 to 4:30. The other one is uh, 5:30 to 7:30. So it is very. I mean, it's good. You know very good for the employees um, because we want them to know and understand English a little bit so that way it's going to be better for them and for the supervisor so that's what we have right now my company currently does not have a formalized uh, program for ESL or anything like that but as we grow I hope that we'll be able to convince that the little bit of cost is well worth it yeah, I would say that 3M doesn't have that either, but in just talking about this too, you know, people, uh, they're so nice again that I, I think in our area, the lead operator has just taken upon himself to, I think you had said print like a one word phrase that describes something and he keeps going back to that. So I think even the people in the area, you see how successful they are and what simple thing can we do to help them? So we, we don't have English as a second language training right on site, but you know, my lead operator is just taking it upon himself to do some things too. And I think you find people in the area do that for them. Uh, sometimes uh, refugees, immigrants, may be professional positions in their native country. They come here and they'll train training and education is necessarily transferred to the United States. Has that been a problem in terms of uh, hiring that uh, they may not have the educational level required? One of our biggest issues uh, at both of the locations that I worked at was always measurement. Um, there, most of the other countries are on a metric system and we are not, so trying to teach them the new measurement. And I know this is main, maybe not on the level that you were looking for, but that's, that's such a huge thing, something so little that we don't think about here. Like, they don't know what a half of an inch is. You know, I don't even know what it is in the metric system and trying to tell them isn't going to benefit me at all because it doesn't help them here. So uh, teaching them how to read a ruler basic down to the one eighth, one eighth of an inch or down to whatever it was needed for that particular job. One of the other things that I've noticed is that if you can get it out of a refugee or immigrant in your interview as far as how high their educational level is or what they did back in their country, which a lot of them don't even put on their resumes because they feel that it's irrelevant, which it's completely relevant in my opinion because all those skills are either transfer 
transferable or cross transferable and you can um, pull certain drivers out of each of those things. I had a uh, one young lady who actually was a teacher in her home country for over 20 years. Uh, why would I not put her in a leadership position? You know, she's able to train, obviously. She's able to teach other people, and she's able to, she had learned English in a matter of, I think, four months from the time she arrived in the country, so obviously she's able to pick up very well. It's up to us as HR professionals to sort of pull that out of, each of the people that we speak to, and we got to find questions um, that can determine that cross transferable skill set or the transferable skill sets. I'm not sure if this it relates to your question, but I did think of in we're manufacturing, so to be hired as a 3M employee, you have to take a manufacturing test. Well, that's a difficult test when you don't know how to read or understand English. So we had to modify our thinking a little bit. So we took that requirement off for this very certain area because it's not so much dealing with machines and manufacturing. It's very manual. So you might have to rethink some of the requirements. Um, and this is working fine for us. And they know if we want to be hired as a 3M employee one day, I'm, they'll probably have to figure out a way to pass that test. But you do have to sometimes just think a little differently. I think that's a key point is that really in the, in the effort to address our employment shortages and the 4.2% unemployment or, that we're dealing with right now, um, employers, it is critical that we do think about our hiring practices differently. It, you know, if something's been in place for 30 years, doesn't make it right into, by today's standards. So employers need to approach their human capital strategies differently, their hiring practices, to really be able to tap into the talent that they need. And I think there was a question back here. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I have a question for all of you guys. I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm with Iowa Workforce Development. We have a lot of immigrants and refugees that come in our office that we refer on to jobs. The struggle that we deal with in our office is we're not allowed to fill out applications for them. So how do you guys suggest us deal with them because they get very upset and very angry with us because they don't understand what the applications are asking and even though we have that huge language barrier with them as well they get very frustrated because we can't do it for them so I know you talked about hiring paperwork have you thought about finding the the common niche of refugees or immigrants and making an application available to them in their native language or how do you suggest us to handle that since we're not able to fill it out for them Uh, we do offer our application in Spanish, but the, the, the only two languages are English and Spanish. So, um, yeah, I can see that's a challenge. One thing that I think is helpful on the employer standpoint is to, uh, if you can find someone that is from that country, bring them out to where your application station is and, and have them help fill out the application. Um, you, I think that's that's really important for them to understand because because we ask questions in America that probably aren't asked in other countries. In some countries, they can ask some crazy stuff on their applications that you never think of seeing on an American application. So that that probably would be the best suggestion would be to get somebody if you can. That's now are they filling out applications at your facility or at, your, at the Iowa Workforce Development? For uh, they're just a general application that you guys. Well, have. however, the job order is written. Oh, okay. If it says obtain a generic application from Iowa Workforce Development. Okay, well, my suggestion. Fill it out for them. Yeah, I understand that. So, what I would do with you is I would, if I was you, I, was, I would call some, comp some companies such as ours and, and talk to the HR department and explain your dilemma and say, hey, can you help with this? Because a lot of companies would, are very eager to, to tap into that employment force and they, they, they would be probably very willing to help you, I would think. And I can't, I want you guys to agree with that. Then. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Or translation services. I would think that if, if maybe you can arrange a group intake and then have an interpreter there who can talk through the individual so they can fill out the applications together as a group. And it, again, the refugees, the refugee services. 
There you go. Send the, <laughs> send, send the refugees to refugee services for assistance. Was there another hand? Come. There's been a lot of talk about um, once you have somebody hired. So uh, and maybe I missed this on the front end of the conversation. I walked in a little bit late, but where do you find folks? I mean, we, you know, we're out there um, advertising for positions, and we don't get the we don't even get applications. So, how, what's what's some tips to advertising for hire? No, 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 you didn't. Actually, it was this question right here. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> well, and, and Brenda, I'll let, I'll let Brenda say this one out loud. Go Brenda, through you, manpower. <laughs> yep, yeah, 3M, actually, the, the refugee uh, program actually was piloted um, with the help of Lauren and uh, Refugee Services. We were able to put together a program for 3M um, and, and launch the pilot program with the refugees. So it was a great opportunity for 3M to try the program out to see if it would work within their facility to see how many changes they made, needed to make. So that that's one solution for you. So you can just call me. Call <laughs> <Go>, Lord. <laughs> exactly. Recruiting and sourcing is always a challenge and sometimes you do have to reach out to your local staffing companies yes. who do have more uh, sourcing opportunities. However, I have in the past contacted the refugee service themselves directly and just said, hey, this is the job I have. I'm struggling. Do you have anybody out there with that skill set? Once they find one person, it seems they always end up finding five or ten more because that one person worked right alongside this person doing the exact same thing. And that's the advantage of that population because they are having such a hard time finding work uh, that they all tend to kind of, as Brandon was saying earlier, group together. You know, you get one, you get several more. Yeah, Jim. I, I think uh, going through the <laughs> going through the uh, the refugee services would be pretty helpful because you, there may be somebody who actually was a diesel mechanic in their home country, and they just don't think they, there's an opportunity here, and they could they could uh, tie that together or a driver or whatever. So. I don't know who's next. Several, oh, <laughs> several hands went up at the same time. I just want to respond to, I want to respond to your same question, too. Some um, refugees and immigrants are not newly refugee and immigrants and may have passed Lauren's hands. <laughs> and so um, what we do at Mercy is we find, um, we go to where people are. We go to the Latino festivals, the Asian festival. We advertise in media. Yeah, that is, does not say Des Moines Register. I hope nobody's here for the register, but we go to media sources that individuals read, listen to where they are. You can go, especially in the Latino community, many businesses in the community, you can advertise in their businesses. We just go to where people are. And then um, Lucy, she works with the Burmese population. That's all I know her by, but I swear to God, she will sell you her entire community. So if you ever get the opportunity to meet Lucy, she is extremely delightful. She will translate for you for free for anything. I mean, she'll do anything for these people, and she will tell you. You can ask a question that tries to get a negative response, you know, like, tell me about a conflict you had in your work, and Lucy will be like, no, they don't have conflicts. <laughs> so Lucy. If you guys ever get the opportunity, Burmese. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Also, I, I think there's that a good idea. Uh, the church pastor would be very good too. Yes. That's why I usually do it. Yes. I was just gonna do the demo charm to work in the community um, contacts. You know, like there are so many organizations who are directed to refugees and immigrants. I was just gonna use a general term to say like working with other communities. Organizations will work with them. Um, I, can I add one? 
you sure can. I just also wanted to um, thank you uh, for putting this together and thank you for sharing your good stories. Um, so the uh, I wanted to put in a plug and a request for continuing um, on-site ESL. Um, there is the 260E funding available from Iowa uh, Department of Eco IEDA, <laughs> is all I know, Economic Development. So there is that funding available and there's lots of organizations that can help you and lots of people in this room even today that we can connect after um, to kind of help, you know, to build that. Um, but that is the next big thing. We really need um, all these people who entered into the workforce didn't really get a chance to go to school or learn ESL or English better and it's just going to make them better citizens, better workers, better people. So just wanted to make a request to seriously think about it. There's lots of resources out there. So thank you. Um, we are really at the at the top of the hour here. However, there's one last question I would like to have the panel kind of share with everyone. I, I, I hope everyone is really getting the sense of how valuable this talent pool is and, and uh, how the, the positive impact that working with immigrant and refugee populations can have on your organization. So with that, I would actually just like to have everyone go down the line and share with us, in, in your opinion, what is the value that, that this immigrant and uh, refugee population brings to your organization and what kind of impact have they had? I think I spoke to it earlier, just how friendly and their positive attitude has worn off on the people around them. Just that impact has been huge. But I would also say that if, if I look back at 2013, the end of that year into 2014 and the overtime that we were working was absolutely outrageous. I, I think probably every weekend we had to require people to work weekends. Now, fast forward that, I know we took at least a 1,000 hours out, and I think they worked maybe one weekend in the fall of 2014. That alone, and again, I'm talking from a manufacturing standpoint, so when you talk about that much overtime in the 30s and 40 percent, and these people don't get a rest, that's, that can uh, really affect employee relations. So just in that aspect, and you know, we were pulling people from every other department to come to this area to help with overtime. And now um, we're caught up. We don't have back orders. I mean, it's, that's great for our customers. That's great for 3M all the way around. Yeah, and the same thing, I mean, productivity, efficiency, and from a manufacturing standpoint, we're all about being lean. And with the refugee population, their work ethic is just so driven. Um, it, it, I've not encountered, um, you know, more driven work ethics in the non-immigrant population, unfortunately. Uh, the other thing from a more individualistic perspective, uh, non-company, is just you, the more you can get them integrated into the workforce, the less social, social services they're going to need um, by helping them. And that gets your communities in better standing and more accepting of them as well. So. Actually, um I would like to uh, tell you about my story, but I look at the time, it's almost, not almost the actually passed, so um, I don't want to, you know, keep going. I don't want to hold, you know, everybody here long, but anyway, um, I personally came through a refugee, so um, I think uh, all the company that I work for here in the United States, um, they really appreciate what you know Red people have done to them. Uh, back in 2007, I worked at uh, JBS, uh, Marshall Town. For that time, the meat pay company, they really have a tough time to find people because of tough jobs. So um, me and my boss, we went to uh, Michigan to recruit the Red people. But uh, a lot of them, uh, they don't want to move because you know, the main thing is the language barrier and they just got here. But uh, we got a few, and then after we brought them back, and we find a place for them and everything. Um, and then they started bringing their friend, their family, um, whoever they know that need a job. And we helped them with everything. And then after that, uh, the company, I mean, feel like there's very good, you know, people, and that they don't need to worry about, uh, you know, 
to find uh, you know other people, and our turnover is uh, went down instead of uh, going up. So that's that's very good and very good impact uh, to the employers. I think our our diverse workforce uh, reflects our customer base, which is also very diverse. So they can help us gain an understanding of our customers and how better to serve them. Um, also, a lot of our smaller customers are entrepreneurs who are from immigrant-owned businesses, which makes sense because if you think about it, an entrepreneur is a risk taker. And what is more, uh, what is more of a risk than to leave the country where you grew up to go somewhere very foreign to? So, they're natural uh, entrepreneurs, and so a lot of the great businesses that are starting up are owned by immigrants and refugees. And I think, uh, you know, we want to be able to serve serve them and and grow along with their businesses. So, I think that's a, another benefit a lot of people don't think about. Right. Absolutely. The economic impact, uh, not only in the communities, as Melissa and, and Brendan had talked about, but just also to your organization, the productivity, um, and, and just really the exposure that we as individuals have to people from different countries. It gets to, to it creates an exciting, um, diverse environment that, uh, that's a lot more inclusive and, and just uh, um, it, it really drives innovation. So we could go on for hours and hours, and I had to table half of the questions that I have, but I appreciate the interactive discussion and if this is something we want to include <laughs> or do more of in the future Dr. Conlon we can we'll probably we'd be happy to do so but um, we appreciate you coming and thank you to thank you to the panel here thank you thank you Karen and thank you